Chapter 7, Neoplastic Disease. In this chapter, we are going to discuss cancer. In this picture, you can see a patient that looks like she's about 38 months pregnant, but actually she has an ovarian cyst. This was the tumor after it was removed. Unfortunately, this is not the world's largest tumor. In the next picture, and in this picture, this is a picture from a video that actually is the world's largest tumor, and I have posted this video on your narrated PowerPoints as well, and I'd like for you to watch it. But this is an individual who has a very large tumor, and all of this is tumor in the abdomen. This turned out to be an ovarian cyst, but this was actually, it still is, the world's largest tumor. So please watch the video. What is cancer? Cancer is diseases in which abnormal cells divide without control and are able to invade other tissues. Cancer literally means uncontrolled cellular growth. It's derived from a Greek word for crab, karakinoma, and as you can see with this spiny crab, this really does give an idea of how cancer can invade surrounding tissues. The word tumor literally means growth. It can also be referred to as neoplasia or new growth. How do we classify cancers? Cancers are classified as benign versus malignant. Most physicians use the word cancer synonymously with malignant, but benign cancers are cancers. They typically are not growing rapidly and they typically do not become life-threatening. Solid versus invasive. Solid tissues tend to be walled off by the body by a connective tissue capsule, where invasive tend to send out little tendrils of cells into the surrounding areas, kind of like that crab that you just saw. In situ versus infiltrating. In situ simply means it is within an area. And primarily we use this for skin cancers or epithelial cancers. So here we see a cell, a single cell, that develops mutations that causes it to become cancerous. That cell now undergoes hyperplasia. It tends to grow rapidly and eventually, if this is a cancerous tumor, it becomes dysplastic and we'll see different variations of these cancer cells, and we'll talk more about that later. But you'll notice at this point it has not crossed the basement membrane. And so as long as it has not crossed this basement membrane, we call this cancer in situ. Once, however, it has crossed the basement membrane and has invaded local tissues, we then call that an invasive cancer. So let's take a look at what constitutes benign versus malignant tumors. First of all, benign tumors tend to grow relatively slowly. They are still growing more rapidly than the normal tissue, but typically grow fairly slowly. Whereas malignant tumors tend to grow very, very rapidly, and this is what allows them to invade local tissues fairly easily. Most benign tumors get walled off because of the relatively slow growth. The body tries to wall them off with a defined fibrous connective tissue capsule, where since malignant tumors are growing so rapidly, they typically do not become encapsulated very easily. Benign tumors tend to not be locally invasive. Part of that is because of this fibrous connective tissue capsule, whereas malignant tumors tend to invade very locally. Benign tumors typically tend to be well differentiated, meaning that most of the cells, even though they are cancer cells, are actually a fairly 
normal population. They look alike. They tend to be the same size. The nuclei tend to be uh, the same. Whereas malignant tumors, the cells are very poorly differentiated. They look nothing like the original cells. They don't look like each other. They tend to be different sizes. The nuclei tend to be different sizes. And so, uh, we see a number of different types of cells within the tumors. Benign tumors, because again of their relatively slow growth, they tend to have a low mitotic index. In other words, if we took a sample of a benign tumor, we would see more than normal cells undergoing mitosis, but versus a malignant tumor, we would see many, many, many more cells undergoing mitosis. And finally, benign tumors do not metastasize. And this is really the big definition between benign versus malignant, is that malignant tumors have a tendency to spread distally or metastasize. This does not mean that every malignant tumor will metastasize, but it has the ability to metastasize. How do we classify and name tumors. Benign tumors are named according to the tissues from which they arise and include the suffix oma. Oma literally means tumor or mass. So a lipoma, such as this one on this gentleman's neck, a lipoma arises from the lipid tissue or fat tissue, and so this is a fatty benign tumor, a lipoma. Gliomas arise from the glial cells within the central nervous system, and oftentimes gliomas are named according to what type of cell they arose from, such as an astrocytoma or a, or a uh, oligodendrocytoma. Leomyoma, leo means smooth, myo muscle, and so this is a smooth muscle benign tumor. Leomyomas are most often seen in the uterus, in the smooth muscle of the uterine wall, and these are sometimes known as fibroid tumors as well. Chondromas originate from cartilage. Meningiomas originate from the meningeal uh, layers around the brain. Malignant tumors are actually also named according to the tissue from which they arose. But typically with malignant tumors, what we look at is what embryological layer did they arise from? So did they arise from the ectoderm, mesoderm, or endoderm? Carcinomas are malignant tumors of epithelial tissues. And so these are primarily going to be the skin tumors that we see. Adenocarcinomas arise from ductal or glandular tissues. So this is a term that we use for these epithelial tissues that form the ducts or glands. Sarcomas originate from the mesoderm and endodermal tissues, or the mesochymal tissues, we call them. Sarcomas also can arise from the blood-forming cells within the bone marrow. Lymphomas arise from lymphatic tissues. And leukemia, of course, arises from blood-forming cells within the bone marrow. Carcinomas involves the epithelial tissues. Carcinomas are the most common malignant type of tumors that we see, with 85% of all tumors found in the skin, large intestine, glands, stomach, lungs, and prostate. Metastasis principally occurs through the lymphatic vessels. So once these carcinomas become invasive and are no longer in situ, they will actually invade localized lymph vessels in the dermis of the skin or the underlying mucosa of the viscera and actually hitch a ride on the lymphatic vessels. Subtypes of these carcinomas include the adenocarcinomas, 
which again are usually seen in internal organs or the glands thereof. Squamous cell carcinomas, which arise from the surface cells in the skin and basal cell carcinomas that arise from the lower levels of the epidermis, basically in the stratum basale. This is a good example of a squamous cell carcinoma. It typically tends to be very raised, and you'll notice that even the surface cells, and we'll talk about why these surface cells are actually dying a little bit later on, but this is because they're far removed from a blood supply in the underlying connective tissues. This actually shows a basal cell carcinoma, and you can see it's not quite as raised, primarily because it's arising from the deeper levels of the epidermis. This is an adenocarcinoma. This is actually in the lungs, and this actually arose from glands within the ductal parts of the lung system. And so this is an adenocarcinoma seen in the lung. Sarcomas arise from those tissues that arose from the mesoderm and the endoderm. So arising from the connective tissues such as fat, bone, cartilage, muscle. They are less common but typically tend to metastasize and become locally invasive much more readily. There's little differentiation within the sarcomas. We actually refer to this as anaplasia, literally meaning lack of form. So these cells don't look like each other. They don't look like the original tissue cells, and they just simply are completely different. And they tend to metastasize primarily through the bloodstream, probably because we have better access to blood vessels in these tissues. Leukemias are neoplasias of blood cells and usually do not form solid tumors. What we will see with most leukemias is depending on what cell line is being affected, we'll actually see an increase in that cell line within the peripheral blood. So it proliferates diffusely within the bone marrow, overgrows, and crowds out normal blood forming cells. And these abnormal cells will then be released into the bloodstream. They spill over into the bloodstream and we'll see a large number of these abnormal cells in circulating within the peripheral bloodstream. How do we name malignant neoplasias? Well, again, if the site is not specified in epithelial tissues, we simply call it a carcinoma. But if we know specifically where it rose from, then we can add some extra words, such as the squamous cell or basal cell carcinoma. If we know that it arose from glandular tissue within organs, we can call them adenocarcinomas. If we see uh, squamous cell carcinoma of the cervix, so you can see within these, we actually have a number of carcinomas, adenocarcinomas. With sarcomas, if the site is not specified, it's simply a sarcoma. If it arose from lymphoid tissue, it's a lymphoma. If it's a bone marrow origin, it's leukemia. If we have plasma cells in bone marrow, it's called multiple myeloma. If it arose from cartilage, it's a chondrosarcoma versus the chondroma, uh, that would be the benign form. In bone tissue, osteosarcoma, again, versus osteoma, with, which is the benign form. Fibrous tissue, fibrosarcoma, smooth muscle, leomyosarcoma versus the leomyoma, that would be the benign form. Others, if the site is not specified, we simply call it a malignant neoplasia. Now, I will say one thing. Melanocytes, if it's the origin, origin of the tumor, it's a malignant melanoma, and there is no benign form of melanoma. These are always malignant. The other thing is that this germ cell origin is called a teratoma. 
And teratomas are never malignant, even though this is on the malignant neoplasia list. Teratomas are always benign. So how does cancer actually form? Well, we don't really know. Cancers do not usually result from mutations within a single gene. Typically, what we're going to see is that a cell requires multiple mutations in order to become a cancerous cell. We do know that there are a group of genes within cells called oncogenes. Literally, the name means cancer-causing genes. What activates these oncogenes to their active form, we simply do not know at this point. We also will have a set of genes called the tumor suppressor genes. And we know within cancer cells that these tumor suppressor genes are actually turned off. So the question becomes, what activates the oncogenes and what turns off the tumor suppressor genes? If we understood the answers to these two questions, we would actually have the cure for cancer. We do know that there will be additional random genetic changes that occur within the cell. So cancer is not just a single mutation that occurs and the cancer cell forms. It is a multiple uh, insult. And again, activation of oncogenes, loss of the tumor suppressor gene function. Cancer is therefore predominantly a disease of aging. The older the cells get, the more times they replicate, the more probable it's likely to have a mutation or multiple mutations occurring. I actually say most people do not die of cancer, but most will die with cancer. Many times on autopsies, we will find cancers that the people did not even know that they had because of the aging process. Now, most cancers do arise from a single stem cell or rogue cell, sometimes known as an outlaw cell. We also will see tumor heterogenicity. As these cancer cells divide, they are going to accumulate even more mutations. Therefore, within a tumor, we may actually have multiple genetic forms of a particular cell. So normally, stem cells, which were from the very beginning, will develop into normal progenitor cells. So these progenitor cells then mature into mature functional cells. But if mutations occur in the stem cells, we can see stem cells then that we would refer to as the cancer stem cells. They will mutate into mutated progenitor cells. We can also see the normal progenitor cells being mutated and forming this group of mutated progenitors as well. These progenitor cells will then form our cancer cells. So you can see in this drawing, the mature cells are all pretty much even. They all look the same because they have the same function. Whereas the cancer cells can take, off, take on a variety of different shapes. So, so here's a picture of what we're talking about with this tumor heterogenicity. So the normal cells are in the green. Here is our founder cancer cell or our outlaw cell. So our first population of tumor cells is in this pink color. As this cell rapidly divides, we get a huge number of those population one cells. But in one of those cells, something happened. Another mutation occurred, and now I have a second population of tumor cells. They begin to undergo 
high mutational rate, and we get a whole bunch of those. Population 1 will still be growing as well, but now I've got population 2. And at some point, perhaps, one of these cells then has a second mutation that occurs, and then we get a third population of cells. And as these cells all grow, they can continue to develop mutations, and we can get a huge number of different subsets within the same uh, tumor population. So if I'm going to treat for a particular cancer cell, so if this one cell gives us all of these subpopulations of cells, my treatment may only be aimed at this population or this population or this one. So what we'll see is that perhaps the yellow population here survives my treatment. Well, what can happen then? They then will become the new foundational cells of new subpopulations. And this gives us our tumor heterogeneity. This is one of the reasons that it's difficult sometimes to treat tumor cells because we get all of these subpopulations of tumor cells. Angiogenesis. This is a word that actually means the growth of new blood vessels. As these tumor cells are rapidly dividing, they need a nutrient and oxygen supply. So what they will simply do is they will secrete angiogenic factors. The angiogenic factors will actually grow new blood vessels. So, and in fact, VEGF literally means vascular endothelial growth factor. There are a number of these factors that cancer cells release. So VEGF, platelet-derived der growth factor, basic fibroblastic growth factor. And this picture actually shows the underside of a tumor within the skin. And all of these small blood vessels are growing in from the larger blood vessels to supply these rapidly dividing cells. This is actually how cancer kills. Cancer cells compete with normal cells for both space and nutrients. Since the cancer cells are rapidly dividing, they are going to take the lion's share of nutrients, starving normal cells, and they are pushing into the area where normal cells exist, literally pushing them out. To so this picture actually shows as these tumor cells are rapidly dividing, they're, release, they're releasing all of these endothelial growth factors. And so normal blood vessels in this area will actually start growing new blood vessels into this tumor. One of the ways that we can treat certain tumors is actually starve their blood supply. If we starve the blood supply, they cannot continue to grow. So tumors will derive their blood supplies from tissues that they invade. And malignant tumors frequently induce angiogenesis in order to proliferate in adjacent normal tissues to, dis to supply the demands of the growing tumors. However, some malignant tumors may even outgrow its own blood supply. Therefore, the part of the tumor with the poorest blood supply will undergo necrosis. If you remember that picture of the squamous cell carcinoma I showed you earlier, the top cells were actually undergoing necrosis. This was because they were far removed from a blood supply and actually were starving. So depending on the location of the tumor, the blood supply will either be rich or poor. In tumors in the lung, blood supply is best at the periphery of the tumor and poorest at the very center of the tumor. So oftentimes in those tumors within the viscera, we'll find necrosis occurring at the center of the tumor mass. If the tumor is growing outward from an epithelial surface, such as in the colon, 
or the skin, the best blood supply will be at the base and the porous will be at the surface. So we'll see necrosis at the surface of these tumors from epithelial uh, origins. Often small blood vessels are exposed in the ulcerated base of the tumor or at the surface if we're talking about an epithelial tumor. And these vessels may ooze blood continuously and this can lead to one of the classic signs of cancer and that is anemia from chronic blood loss. An ulcerated tumor will, may be the source of even severe hemorrhage at the surface. Oftentimes in colon cancer, this is one of the things that we'll see. This is why we can see occult blood in the stool samples. This is actually showing a tumor, and this tumor is actually necrosing at the surface. So this is an epithelial-based to, uh, tumor, and so this is why we're seeing that necrosis at the surface. Now, how again do these cancers actually form? Well, we again know that there are certain certain uh, genes that are necessary to either be turned on or turned off. The proto-oncogenes, these actually promote normal cell growth. If we get a point mutation or amplification or translocation within these proto-oncogenes, this then forms the oncogene, and this results in unrestrained cellular growth. We have a number of tumor suppressor genes, and their normal function is to inhibit cell proliferation. In other words, they put the brakes on uncontrolled cellular mitosis. In this case, both of the tumor suppressor genes in the pair have to be inactivated in the same cell in order to support cancer growth. And we also have those DNA repair genes, which will correct errors in DNA duplication. Most oftentimes, these also will have to be inactivated in order to increase the mutation rate. In other words, mutations that do occur will not get repaired. So here's some normal colon tissue, a uh, nice simple columnar epithelium with goblet cells. And what we can see is the loss of a particular gene called the APC gene. This can lead to polyp formation. However, if the polyp continues to grow and a second mutation occurs in what's known as the RAS gene, this can actually lead to larger polyps. And most of these small and even large polyps will be benign tumors. However, if we get the mutation or loss of the p53 gene function, this then causes this, these hyperplastic cells to become dysplastic, and we can then see invasive colon cancer. So here's our karyotype in a normal human healthy colon cell. And this is what we can see in some of these colorectal cancer cells. So first of all, you can see multiplication. You can see translocation. For example, here on chromosome pair number one, we actually have part of probably chromosome number nine uh, on that one. So we have multiplication. We have translocation. Uh, here in pair 20, we've got a whole bunch of stuff, 11. So now we've got 59 chromosomes, and so this is certainly an abnormal cell. So again, normal versus cancerous colon tissue. We do know that there are other factors besides just genetics in neoplastic disease. Carcinogens are mutagens that cause cancer. Mutagens increase the frequency of mutations, carcinogens then are going to cause cancer from those mutations. 
and we know that there are a huge number of chemical carcinogens in our environment. Certainly, gene and other chromosomal abnormalities, such as the Cri du Chat deletion in chromosome number 5, so we have this deleted portion here of chromosome pair number 5, can also sometimes result in cancer formation. Failure, failure of immunological defenses. We are all actually producing cancer cells right now. However, our natural killer cells and our immune surveillance normally will destroy those cells since they are abnormal cells. When we lose this ability to distinguish between these normal and abnormal cells, oftentimes we will see the cancer cells getting a foothold. There are some cancers that are directly inherited. These are factually fairly rare, but certainly heredity does play a role in the propensity for developing cancer. And then certainly we now know that there are several viruses that are now involved in causing cancer in humans, such as the human papillomavirus causing cervical cancer in females. So we talked about these three genes that play important roles and the mutations that are necessary for tumor formation. So the proto-oncogenes that mutate to oncogenes and turn on the tumor suppressor genes and the DNA repair genes. So let's talk about each one of those. The tumors caused by viruses Leukemia and lymphoma, we now know that there's a virus called the T-cell leukemia lymphoma virus, HTLV1, that is related to the AIDS virus. This can cause a leukemia or lymphoma within HIV patients. Human herpes virus number 8, HHV8, is now associated with Kaposi sarcoma, which is right here. This is a very rare skin cancer uh, seen only in HIV patients or extreme immune compromised patients that develop HHV8 infections. Certainly, papillomavirus predisposes to cervical carcinomas, and I just love this picture because all of these are cervical warts, and that's what the condylomas are called. Chronic viral hepatitis with hepatitis both B and C viruses can result in liver cancers. And nasopharyngeal carcinoma from the Epstein-Barr virus, this is actually the herpes virus that also causes infectious mononucleosis. We know that all of our cells undergo apostosis. And so we have this program cellular death within our genetics. This influences the survival time of all cells. If, however, these regulatory genes fail, the cells can continue to accumulate. And the problem with this is that they can accumulate mutations. If this occurs, these cells can eventually form tumors. This is simply cells undergoing apostosis. One of the important things about cancer cells is that cancer cells become what we call immortal cells. The body cells normally are not immortal. They have that programmed cellular death and they can only divide so many times. One of the things that will allow only division so many times is something called the telomeres. These are protective caps on each of the chromosomes and are held in place by an enzyme called telomerase. These block cell division and prevent immortality of the cell. It's kind of like this. The telomeres will become smaller and smaller with each cell division. It's kind of like our copier machines that every time we make a copy, they tick off that they've made the copy. The telomeres actually do this. 
and it's programmed in so that basically what will happen is after a certain period we can no longer copy the DNA and the cells will undergo apostosis. However, cancer cells can reactivate the telomerase and regrow the telomeres. This then allows uncontrolled cellular division and proliferation of the cancer cells and they become immortal. I like this picture. So here's our nice young chromosome, nice large telomeres on their ends. Here's our older chromosomes and the telomeres have decreased greatly. So in normal cells, every time we copy that DNA, we take a little bit of the telomere off. But in cancer cells, they can regrow or reactivate this telomerase and regrow these telomeres so that we can continue to undergo mitosis in these cancer cells. The proto-oncogenes, these normal growth genes in the human chromosomes, okay, will become an oncogene if a mutation occurs or genes are translocated to other chromosomes. The oncogenes are abnormally functioning genes that stimulate growth cells or stimulate the cell growth excessively, leading to unrestrictive proliferation. So my challenge to you is if you can figure out what causes our proto-oncogenes to become oncogenes, then this will give you an idea of how to cure cancer. So there's our proto-oncogene in the cell. If we get translocation or transposition, we get new promo promoters of these genes and we'll have normal growth stimulating proteins in excess. Or we could actually amplify the gene, making many copies of that gene that will also allow two excessive growth stimulation proteins. Or we can have point mutations where again, we get the oncogene formation that simply overproduces our normal growth stimulating protein or we get hyperactive or degradation resistant proteins that will also cause increased growth of the cells. We do know in one case, one of these translocations that can cause proto-oncogenes to become oncogenic. The Philadelphia chromosome is a reciprocal translocation that's best known for this. What we will see with the Philadelphia chromosome is a reciprocal translocation of the ends of chromosomes number 9 and 22. So here's number 9, here's number 22. We simply are going to take off part of 22, put it on 9, take off a part of 9, and put it on 22. This actually causes an oncogene on the translocated piece of chromosome number nine to exhibit increased activity. So this is the problem right here. The tumor suppressor genes normally prevent DNA replication and completion of mitosis. They normally suppress cell proliferation. Loss of the function of the tumor suppressor genes by mutation then may lead to unrestrained unrestrained cell growth. The tumor suppressor genes do exist at pairs at the corresponding gene loci on homologous chromosomes and therefore both of these pairs must cease to function before the cell malfunctions. If we only get a mutation in only one of the pairs we will still have a normally functioning cell. The DNA repair genes will regulate processes that monitor and repair any errors in the DNA duplication process during cell division. DNA damage from radiation, for example, or chemicals or other environmental agents, or even just spontaneous mutations. 
Mutations are any change in the normal arrangement of DNA nucleotides on the DNA change. Failure in the function of these repair genes increases the likelihood that a DNA mutation will survive within the cell. Now, heredity in tumors, predisposition apparently results from a multifactorial inheritance pattern. At-risk individuals have inherited sets of genes that influence hormonal or enzyme-regulated biochemical processes in the body that increase the susceptibility to a specific cancer. For example, we know that in breast cancer, 80 to 90 percent of all cases, there's no family history of disease. However, 10 percent of all breast cancers are linked to certain gene mutations within families. We know that certain cancers have a predisposition for being inherited within families, such as breast cancer susceptibility with the genes BRCA1 and BRCA2, the Philadelphia chromosome, multi-polyposis of the colon, which is a form of colon cancer, neurofibromatosis, which is a form of cancer of the peripheral nerves where you develop these multiple tumors at the end of the peripheral nerves, so they show up in the skin, and multiple endocrine adenomatosis. All of these are just examples of particular cancers that tend to run in families with these particular genetic inheritance. Certain precancerous conditions tend to become malignant. For example, uh, in certain colon cancers, the polyps that are benign actually then to have a tendency to develop malignancy later on. Some of examples of these would be actinic keratoses, which are small, encrusted uh, scaly patches that develop on sun-exposed skin primarily, and they can develop into cancers if left untreated. Lentigo malignant, these are freckle-like proliferations of melanin-producing cells that again may develop on sun-exposed skin. Oftentimes these will develop into malignant melanomas. And leukoplaca, which are thick white patches in the mucosal membranes of the mouth from exposure to tobacco tars from either pipe or cigar smoking or even smokeless tobacco such as snuff or chewing tobacco can actually then develop into a carcinomas within these mucosal membranes. Leukoplaca may give rise to squamous cell carcinomas within the oral cavity. Precancerous conditions should always be treated appropriately to prevent malignant changes, which occurs in many, but not all of the cases. So just because you do have a precancerous polyp within the colon does not mean that you're going to develop colon cancer. So this is actually a precancerous polyp. Uh, it's a fairly broad-based polyp, and that is one thing that we look at uh, within the colon. Most polyps are going to be a little more pendulous than this, that are the precancerous forms of polyps. Uh, but if left untreated, oftentimes they can develop into colon cancer. Now, another reason why cancer can arise is because failure of our immunological defenses. So cancers arise from, again, multiple genetic insults to the genome rather than just a single gene mutation. So immunologic defenses, our natural killer cells, may actually see a cell and think, mm, yeah, it's not quite normal, but it's not really abnormal. And so it may actually leave it alone until it develops other, multi or other genetic insults. And as that occurs, this then causes these cells to be characterized by activation of the oncogenes, loss of function of the tumor suppressor genes, 
This was followed by additional random genetic changes within the tumor cells that then indicate instability of the tumor cell gene. So just like when we talked about tumor heterogeneity, so while the natural killer cells may leave one set subset of cells alone because, well, they're quite not abnormal, but then by the time that we get back to them, we have a number of other subpopulations that now the immune system is behind and cannot get under control. So mutant cells produce cell proteins not present in normal cells. These proteins will be recognized typically as abnormal by the immune system and will be destroyed. The immune system then will destroy these abnormal cells via cell-mediated and humoral mechanisms. And again, these natural killer cells will be out there looking at the surface major histocompatibility antigens going, are you a normal or not normal cell? So how do we diagnose tumors? Well, certainly we want to recognize the early warning signs and symptoms. The earlier that we can recognize cancer, the better our treatment options will be. Certainly we need a complete medical history and physical examination of the patient. There are numerous laboratory procedures that, that can be done. Examination of the rectum and colon via colonoscopy. Vaginal examination, pap smear in women for cervical cancer. Examination and of the esophagus and stomach uh, via a scope. Radiological studies. Smears of abnormal sm cells shed from the surface of the tumors. Cytology from smears, fine needle aspiration or biopsies and even frozen sections. And these are slides prepared and stained for rapid histological diagnosis. We often use frozen sections when we're in surgery removing a cancerous lesion so that we know if we've got clean margins on the edges of our sections that we took. The American Cancer Society has seven early warning signs of cancer. And it actually forms the acronym caution. C, a change in bowel or bladder habits. A, a sore that does not heal. The U, unusual bleeding or discharge from anywhere in the body. T, thickening or a lump in the breasts, testicles, or elsewhere. I, for indigestion or difficulty in swallowing. O, obvious changes in the size, color, shape, or thickness of a wart, mole, or mouth sore, or any other unusual uh, lesion in the skin. Nagging, cough, or hoarseness uh, for the end. We can also, in some cancers, do something called a tumor association antigen test. Some cancers secrete substances that can be detected in the blood by uh, lab tests. The carcinoembryonic antigen, CEA, is present in amounts related to the size of the tumor and its possible spread. This is produced by most malignant tumors of the GI tract, the pancreas, and the breast. Alpha fetoprotein. This protein is normally produced by fetal tissues in the placenta, but this is not produced by adult cells. So elevated levels of alpha fetoprotein can actually indicate cancer in an adult, and primarily this is carcinoma of the liver. Human chorionic gonadotropin, normally produced by the placenta, but we actually see HCG elevated in certain reproductive cancers, especially testicular carcinoma. And the last one, acid phosphatase. This is normally produced by prostate epithelial cells in very small amounts. However, acid phosphatase is typically elevated in prostate cancer. This is actually known as the PSA test for prostatic specific antigen.
This is a photomicrograph of a pap smear. These are the normal epithelial cells of the cervix, and these are cancerous cells. You can look at these cells and see that they're different shapes. The nuclei are different shapes, uh, and so this is actually cervical cancer. We can diagnose cancer based upon the manifestations, based on the site of where the cancer is, and the tumor size. Also, we're going to use our diagnostic testing. So again, depending on the cancer, there are a number of different tests that we can use. One of the things that we always want to do is stage the cancer. In other words, where are we in the process of the malignancy? Microscopic analysis for staging-based presence of metastasis is one way that we can do this. And this is still used in the United States. Stage one cancer means that no metastasis has occurred from the primary tumor. There's no metastasis to distant organs. Stage two, there is local invasion. In other words, on our biopsy, we actually see that we have cancer cells at the very edge. That means that we still have cancer cells that have moved into the surrounding normal tissues. Stage three, we see spread to regional structures, such as with lung cancer. We now have localized spread into the wall of the thoracic cavity, for example. And then stage four, we have distinct, distant metastasis to other areas of the body. Now, the World Health Organization has come up with a new system called a TNM system, and this is now being used by most other countries in the world, and it's starting to be used here in the United States to some degree. And I'm going to compare the two systems here in just a moment. But the TNN system, the T stands for tumor spread, so has it spread locally? The N is for lymph node involvement and the M is for the presence of distant metastasis. So in the TNN system, the T, if we have a T0, and we're going to use breast cancer as an example here, T0 means that the breast is free of, the tu of a, any tumor. T1 means the lesion is less than two centimeters in size. A T2 would be the lesion is two to five centimeters. T3, the skin and or chest wall is involved by local invasion. So as we increase the numbers, the tumor actually gets larger. The N for lymph node involvement, a higher number means more nodes are involved. If we have an N0, that means no axillary nodes are involved in this particular breast cancer. N1 means that mobile nodes are involved and N2 means that fixed nodes are involved. Uh, mobile nodes tend to be those nodes that we see riding along the lymphatic vessels, whereas in or fixed nodes tend to be those larger groups like the axillary nodes. The M standing for metastasis, M simply is the extent of distant metastasis. If we have an M0 tumor, there's no demonstrable metastasis in any other areas. M1 means there's demonstrable metastasis from the primary tumor. So again, in a breast tumor, let's say, for example, we now have a breast tumor cell tissue in the liver. M2, we have suspected metastasis. So in this case, we may have multiple tumors within other areas, but did they actually come from the primary breast tumor or are they actually separate tumors unto themselves? While we think that these probably have metastasized from the breast tumor to the liver, the lung, and the bone, we cannot necessarily say that they are the same tumors probably partly in due to the fact of tumor heterogeneity. But we simply now have multiple tumors at multiple sites. So let's compare the staging and the TNM system. So if I have a stage one cancer, 
That means in the TNM system, I have a T1 or T2. Uh, I have N0 for the node involvement and M0 for metastasis. And prognosis for uh, stage 1 cancers in most cancers, not all, is a 5-year survival rate is greater than 90%. So again, we want to catch these cancers early. A stage 2 would have a TNM of T3 or T4, but again, N0, M0. Depending on if you're a T3 or T4, uh, the five-year survival rate would be 70 to 85 percent for a T3, 55 to 65 percent for a T4. Stage 3, any T level, and we can then divide stage 3 into N1 where we have mobile nodes involved. Your survival rate for five years goes to 45 to 55 percent with no metastasis. If we have an N2 or N3, our five-year survival rate drops to 20 to 30%. But stage four, any T, any M, or sorry, any N and M1 with known distant metastasis, our five-year survival rate drops to less than 5%. So again, we want to catch these cancers early on because our five-year survival rate is much better. Now, what are some of the clinical manifestations of cancer? One of the major ones is going to be pain. Typically, there's little or no pain associated in the early stages of cancer. And this is why that oftentimes we can't necessarily find these cancers early on is because the patient reports no symptoms whatsoever. Pain can be influenced, however, by fear, anxiety, sleep loss, fatigue, and the overall physical deterioration that can come from the cancer's uh, progression. But what can actually cause this pain? Well, certainly pressure. Just simply having this now tumor mass that's pressing on the normal tissues, uh, causing pressure with, on pain receptors. Obstruction in tubular organs, such as with colon cancer. Invasion of sensitive structures in the surrounding area from where the tumor is originating. Stretching of visceral surfaces. Think about that 303 pound tumor in that female. While uh, she saw no clinic, major clinical signs early on, the tumor actually became extremely large pressing on all the visceral surfaces that were surrounding the tumor. And certainly tissue destruction. Does the immune system come in and try to actually uh, destroy these cells? And the answer is yes. And so will we get inflammation? We will, and that will cause pain. Fatigue. This is a very sub subjective clinical manifestation of cancer. And so this is what the patient is reporting. Tiredness, weakness, lack of energy, inability to concentrate, exhaustion, depression, sleepiness, boredom, lack of motivation. Think about this. If someone just told you you had cancer, would you have some of these characteristics as you dealt with that diagnosis? Fatigue is the most commonly reported manifestation of cancer by these patients. So I put this uh, pie chart down here. So 78% of patients survey experience debilitating fatigue. 32% say every day they're just exhausted. 21% say on most days they're exhausted. Another 14% say at least once a week they feel exhausted. 11% uh, say only a few days each month. And only 20% say hardly ever. And another 2% just simply don't know. So if we added all these together, 78% of the patients report experiencing this debilitating fatigue. So it is the most commonly reported manifestation by cancer patients. Suggested causes of the fatigue, certainly sleep disturbances. Well, think about it. 
Are you going to have anxiety issues with this? Absolutely. Could that cause sleep disturbances? Absolutely. Biochemical changes from circulating cytokines secondary to disease and the uh, inflammation and even the treatment. The psychosocial factors, just simply having a diagnosis of cancer can cause uh, depression and restlessness. The level of activity, especially certainly in certain treatments, you simply don't feel like doing anything and you just feel tired all the time. Nutritional status, oftentimes cancer patients don't want to eat. And so can changes in nutrition actually result in fatigue? Absolutely. And environmental factors. So we also see in many patients the syndrome of cachexia. Cachexia is the most severe form of malnutrition. It is present in approximately 80% of all cancer patients at time of death. This includes anorexia, early satiety, meaning they might eat a couple of bites and say, I'm full. This can lead to weight loss, severe anemia, asthenia, taste alterations, altered protein, lipid, and carbohydrate metabolism. And this can be due to the cancer itself or actually treatment as well. So here's a gentleman this is what he looked like before. This is what he looks like after. And many times these cancer patients at time of death are simply a skeleton with skin stretched over it. Anemia. Anemia is defined as a lack of hemoglobin in the blood. And this can be due to decreased red blood cells or simply decreased hemoglobin itself. Several mechanisms can result in anemia. Certainly chronic bleeding resulting in iron deficiency. So remember I said in angiogenesis, those little small blood vessels, they typically are very friable or very fragile. They can break open and cause chronic bleeding uh, in the tumor. Severe malnutrition because of not eating, uh, anxiety issues, etc., we can see not taking in enough iron or other things like B12 and folic acid. The medical therapies themselves, if we're doing radiation, we're going to be killing the precursors of the erythrocytes in the bone marrow. And what if you simply have a malignancy in the bone forming organs, that's going to decrease the number of red cells that you produce. Along with the red blood cells, however, we oftentimes will also affect the white blood cells and platelets. So we see leukopenia and thrombocytopenia. This can be due to direct tumor invasion of the bone marrow uh, that causes this or chemotherapeutic drugs that are toxic to bone marrow. And infection Actually, risk will increase when the absolute neutrophil and lymphocyte counts fall. So as we get this leukopenia and thrombocytopenia, we actually can see bleeding disorders and we can see increases in risk of certain infections in these cancer patients. And then we have a group called the perineoplastic syndromes. And basically, uh, these are just et cetera other symptoms that cannot be explained by the local or distant spread of the tumor or by effects of hormones released from the tissues from which the tumor arise or the tumor itself. And so this I just put into the other category. So how do we treat tumors? The best way we can treat tumors is to surgically remove them if that's possible. This is a lipoma that is actually being removed from a patient uh, and it's walled off by connective tissue capsule and so it's actually fairly easy removal. This is the thigh area here. However, malignant tumors because of their locally invasive spread are much more difficult to remove completely because we have to take normal tissue with them. Radiotherapy. 
We used to, in radiation, simply light the patient up and hope for the best. Radiation kills any rapidly dividing cell, that includes cancer cells. But we have gotten much better at our dosing and at our pinpointing uh, the radiation to a particular area of the body. This picture actually shows a mask in this patient that was made specifically for the patient so that we can aim the radiation at a very pinpoint area within the tissues in order to leave the other normal tissues alone. Certain hormones can be used to, to treat certain cancers. Some cancers are dependent on hormones. Others will actually die if certain hormones are in place. Anti-cancer drugs along with adjuvant chemotherapy. Any chemotherapeutic drug for cancers will kill again any rapidly dividing cells. Most of the time, these chemotherapeutic drugs are extremely toxic to these rapidly dividing cells. So oftentimes, we'll see changes in skin, loss of hair, because those are normally rapidly dividing cells. But hopefully, we will also get the cancer cells. So we oftentimes will use chemotherapy in combination with either radiation or surgery or some other type of therapy. And others now include specific uh, cancer treatments for a specific tumor cell in a specific patient. And so we'll look at some of these others here in a moment. Immunotherapy. We can utilize several different things that are very nonspecific, such as certain interferons, while interferons interfere with the viral replication within host cells, some interferons also are known to actually kill cancer cells. Interleukin-2, one of the interleukins, has also been used in immunotherapy in certain cancers. And there are certain cytokines that are used now. Specific immunotherapies include tumor infiltrating lymphocyte therapy. In other words, we have actually made lymphocytes sensitized to the cancer cell within the specific cancer or the specific patient. We now have a number of tumor vaccines. These tumor vaccines are given to the patient to allow the immune system to better able or be better able to actually attack the cancer cells. And we even now have tumor antibody therapy where we can make antibodies to again the cancer cells. Chemotherapy eliminates any cells that are rapidly dividing. And so cancer cells and rapidly dividing normal cells that are found in the mouth, skin, hair, bone marrow, digestive tract, kidney, bladders, etc., all of those epithelial cells can be affected. However, normal cells will also recover more quickly and side effects disappear gradually, typically. So you lose your hair, but normally it will come back. How soon the patient will feel better depends on the overall health of the individual and the type of anti-cancer drugs that are actually being used on the patient. Certain side effects of chemotherapy can include anemia because, again, we're reducing the bone marrow's ability to make red blood cells. And so extreme fatigue, weakness, tiredness, paleness, dizziness is experienced by more than half of the patients taking chemotherapeutic agents. Constipations, uh, certain drugs, certain chemotherapeutic drugs will decrease physical activity, an unbalanced diet. Some will even just simply slow down uh, gut motility because of the decrease in the mucosal lining of the digestive tract. Depression. Both physical and emotional stress can actually take a toll, and the chemotherapy oftentimes will make you feel extremely bad, and this can lead to depressive episodes. Some patients 
They don't get constipation, but what they get is diarrhea. And again, oftentimes these are the drugs that are affecting the mucosal cells in the intestinal tract. This can result in diarrhea episodes. And then certainly just fatigue. Hair loss, alopecia, and this can be body hair, scalp hair. Uh, even people sometimes have lost eyebrows and eyelashes. Because of the reduced ability of the bone marrow to produce white blood cells, we'll see increased infections typically in these patients. The loss of appetite, this can be due to multiple things, just not feeling good, uh, not wanting to eat. Uh, oftentimes chemotherapy will cause vomiting, nausea, so you don't want to eat. See mouth gum and throat problems and especially mucosal sores. Nausea, vomiting, we see sexual problems. In men, this oftentimes affects sperm counts, lowering them dramatically because, again, their spermatogenic cells are normally undergoing uh, mitosis and meiosis. And so this can be temporary or sometimes actually can result in permanent infertility in males. In women, certain chemotherapeutic agents can cause irregular menstrual periods vaginal dryness and infection, and even menopause-like symptoms. Now, survival rates. Typically in adult cancers, we look at five-year survival rates. So, okay, this varies from cancer to cancer, but in most cancers that we look at, survival rates vary from four to more than 95% at five years. So, so for example, in thyroid cancers, most thyroid cancers have a 95% five-year survival rate versus pancreatic cancers, which have typically about a 4% five-year survival rate. That means that in pancreatic cancer, only four patients out of every 100 will live five years after diagnosis. Cancer remains second to heart disease as the most common cause of death in the United States. It has in certain years actually outpaced heart disease, but right now I think it believe, I believe that it is now second only to cancer and causing death in the U.S. and in most industrialized countries. One in every four people will develop cancer in their lifetimes. So, Lung cancer actually is one of the most common cancers affecting males. Breast cancer is one of the most common cancers that affects females, even though 5% of all new breast cancers every year is actually diagnosed in males in the United States. Early diagnosis and treatment will enhance survival rate as we saw on our comparison chart to the staging and TNN system. Chances for survival significantly are reduced after tumor metastasizes to regional lymph nodes or to distant sites. Five-year survival does not indicate cure. Some types will reoccur and can prove fatal at that point. Tumors may have already spread by the time of diagnosis and initial treatment but metastatic deposits can be held in check by immune, by immune defense mechanisms and show up even after the five years. Recurrence simply typically occurs because of failure of the body defenses and reactivation of the tumor at the distant site. Sudden malignant tumors reoccur and prove fatal many years after the initial treatment. I knew of a patient with breast cancer that survived 10 years. At 12 years after initial diagnosis, she had metastatic tumors in her liver and her bone, and that's what actually killed her was the metastatic breast cancer tumors. Breast cancer and malignant melanoma are both prone to late reoccurrence. So in breast cancers, we look at 5, 10, 15, and now even 20-year survival rates. Breast cancers, 65% overall 
have a five-year survival rate. After 10 years, we only see a 50% survival rate. This table out of your text actually shows some of these five-year survival rates by stages. So breast cancer in females in the United States, and this was from 2004 to 2010. All stages at five years, we had 89% survival rate. If we already had distant metastasis, however, it was only a 25% survival rate at five years. Colon and rectal cancer, 65%, but again, distant metastasis already occurring at time of diagnosis simply meant that we went down to 13% five-year survival rate. And you can read down through these. Now you'll notice that some of the cancers are not even listed on here, such as osteosarcoma, rhabdomyosarcomas. The reason for this is osteosarcomas and rhabdomyosarcomas, which are cancers of striated skeletal muscles, don't have five-year survival rates. They just simply do not survive to five years. Now, in pediatric cancer, however, we look at a little difference because in pediatric cancer, all of their cells are rapidly dividing in those growth phases. So we look at what's called the period of risk for pediatric cancer. This is the time period determined by the age of the child times two at diagnosis plus nine, nine months of intrauterine time. And we use this period of risk up to a the time of somewhere between 14 to 16 years of age. At that point, we then switch over to the adult five-year survival rates. So for example, a child that was diagnosed at the age of five with a cancer, the period of risk then would be five years times two, so five plus five plus nine months. So the period of risk for redevelopment of this cancer is from 10 years to nine months. That means that this child would be considered during the period of risk until they were age 16. So five plus the 11 years, basically 16 years of age. So the earlier they're diagnosed, the smaller the period of risk, the later they're diagnosed, the longer the period of risk will be for that patient. Now, a little bit about cancer epidemiology. We see that in this picture, and this was for 2017, estimated cases of new cancer cases in each state. And in Missouri, we had about 34,000 and a half number of new cases of cancer. This is cancer overall. In Florida, 125,000. Uh, in uh, New York, uh, 107,000 and a half cases uh, uh, within 2017. And so high population areas, you see Illinois is almost twice Missouri, and most of those will be occurring up here in the Chicago region. Uh, California, because of the larger population. So if we adjusted this for population sizes within the states, we probably would have a pretty uh, normal amount of cancer uh, per population in each of these states. Environmental lifestyle factors and genetic factors are both going to be involved in the formation of cancer. Patterns of cancers typically tend to be more environmental and not genetic, surprisingly enough. Genetic alterations and abnormalities drive cancer at the cellular level, but many of these genetic alterations and abnormalities are actually caused by in, in the external environment. Two thirds of all cancers are actually caused by the environment lifestyle factors interacting with the genes causing oncogene formation and the turning off of the tumor suppressor genes. Cancer is a major cause of morbidity and mortality worldwide. Again, in the United States, cancer is second only to heart disease. However, the incidence of cancer seems to be decreasing overall. 
Prostate cancers in male and breast cancers in both females and males are the most frequently diagnosed cancers in the United States currently. Death rates have dramatically decreased for pediatric cancers. So it used to be that 80% of all cancers in children would cause death. We are now currently seeing death rates for pediatric cancers overall being only 20%. That means only one in every five children diagnosed with cancer will die from that cancer. Death rates for adults decreased in the seven of the top 15 cancer types within the last few years. Death rates are, however, increasing for cancers of pancreas, liver, and uterus, and melanoma, and especially melanomas in men. This was an interesting uh, chart that, or graph that was studied uh, at the CDC, and they looked at death rates for cancers among women from 1930 to 2009. And it was interesting to see that uterine cancers actually were dropping. Breast cancers remained fairly normal. The interesting thing was that lung and bronchial cancers actually increased over the 18 or 1980s to 2000s. And it was interesting that the increase actually started here in the mid-1960s. Some reasons of this may have actually been that now women were entering the workforce in larger numbers than ever since World War II in the 1940s, and that more women were actually now smoking. And so this may be one of the reasons why lung cancer and bronchial cancers actually have been increasing over the last several decades in females. However, we are starting to see a trend that that is starting to also decrease. And you'll notice that lung cancer actually, it, deaths from lung cancers are actually greater than breast cancer, of colon, and rectal cancers in females during this time period. Some of these environmental factors include tobacco use, and this is tobacco in all forms, alcohol consumption, and we know that actually alcohol itself is related to cancers within the oral cavity and the esophageal cancers. But interestingly enough, oftentimes alcohol users also typically tend to be tobacco users. And alcohol actually acts as a solvent for the carcinogens found in cigarette smoke. There are 4,000 known carcinogens in tobacco. The diet, we eat so many preserved foods, and this is a good example right here. Nitrites in preserved meats actually can cause cancer within patients. However, interestingly enough, vitamin C from citrus fruits actually will negate the effects of many of these nitrites. So if you're gonna eat summer sausage or hot dogs or bologna, Eat an orange with it. That'll help keep you from developing cancer from these. Obesity is another issue. We find that especially certain cancers like breast cancer are more common in obese uh, females. So, and this can also possibly have something to do with the diet as well. Radi Radiation exposure. We are constantly being bombarded by low levels of radiation on a daily basis. Even just sitting in front of my computer screen right now, I'm being exposed to radiation. The fact that my cell phone is nearby, I'm being exposed to radiation. Level of physical activity, and this may actually also go back to the obesity and diet issues. The more physically active a patient is, the less likely they are to develop cancer. This does not necessarily mean that just because you're a couch potato, you will develop cancer, or if you're a marathon runner, you won't. But certainly there has been some links in there. Exposure to carcinogens. And again, what carcinogens are out there? Well, just name something. I expect I can find some study somewhere 
that will show you that there's some carcinogenic effect of, of whatever that is. Sexual behaviors. We know that many of the sexually transmitted viral diseases, especially like HPV, have been known to cause cancers and things such as hepatitis, a, or hepatitis B and C also are sexually transmitted diseases. Occupational and chemical hazards. And I don't know if anybody knows what these fibers are, but this is asbestos that was used commonly as an insulator. Uh, it's also still used commonly in brake pads and other applications today on shipbuilding. And so certainly the commercials for it, the mesothelioma lawyers talking about, have you had asbestos exposure? Well, certainly, yes, there were occupational chemical hazards that we're exposed to on a daily basis. And then certainly air pollution both indoor and outdoor pollution. And I even put in just normal um, pollution here, but this is an interesting one, and this is radon gas. Some of you may remember a few years ago, we had a big thing about radon gas uh, causing cancer, and the radon gas was coming into our houses. Well, radon is a naturally occurring element in the earth, and, it can, and the isotopes of radon can give off low levels of uh, radiation. And so one of the things that people were afraid of was that this radon gas would cause cancer. Well, here's my advice. Simply let your house blow through every once in a while. That will clear out the radon. The problem is we have actually built buildings that are hermetically sealed, such as our classroom itself. There's no opening uh, to the outside. We're completely reliant on the air handling system of the building. And so this can actually increase the indoor air pollution that we see in the buildings. And then I just wanted to put this up just FYI. Uh, other common causes of death other than heart disease or cancer in the United States. And you'll notice here in the Midwest region uh, in Missouri, it's stroke is number three, Kansas, Nebraska, Oklahoma, it's respiratory diseases. And this includes everything from influenza uh, to now COVID-19, unfortunately. Um, accidents, however, are the third leading cause of death in Florida. Uh, in Mississippi, Louisiana, New Mexico, um, Arizona, and Wyoming. And so again, you can see stroke, respiratory diseases, and accidents are going to be these other causes of death. But I'll leave you with this last slide, and I just thought this was funny, because the most common of death, cause of death that they keep covering up in Missouri, that's land sharks. <laughs> Kansas, dust in the wind. I love the fact in Florida, it's just Florida. And in Indiana, nobody has actually ever died in Indiana. So I guess if you want to live forever, move to Indiana. I thought it was interesting also that in Alaska, it's vampires, but in Hawaii, it's Bigfoot. So just thought I'd put a little humor in here at the end. Have a great one.